You may be seated. I believe the recording equipment is on. Greetings to the listening audience that is now joining us. Good evening. You are joining the worship service already in progress of Sovereign Grace Baptist Church, this time not coming to you from Minneapolis, Minnesota, in the United States of America, but rather in St. Paul, Minnesota, on this Sunday night, February the 4th, 2024. I'm the pastor of Sovereign Grace Baptist Church, Reverend Dr. Brian James Shanley, and you need to be excited because it's Black History Month. And we are going to acknowledge it. If you have ever known me, if you've been my student down through the years, if you followed the ministry God has given me, nobody has to tell you because you already know that every year, every February, no matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing, no matter who I'm working for, I walk up into whatever sanctuary, I take a mic, I rip it in half, and I acknowledge the journey that black Americans have traveled historically over the past 500 years on this continent. When I've taught about this subject, we've celebrated the victories, we've acknowledged the accomplishments, we've cried at the losses, we've grieved at the injustices, we've learned from the past, but most importantly, above all else, we've broken down and learned from Scripture. All you got to do is look at the archives of Black History Month messages that I've done down through the years. Look at the 2023 lecture series that I did in uh, last year in St. Paul at a different church, not this one, for the 50th anniversary of rap music and the hip-hop culture. We don't have it out there streaming on the internet, but we do sell the audio CDs, and you can make fun of me all you want, but one day, if the internet makes Christianity illegal and the exchange of religious information very difficult, you're going to have a hard copy right on the shelf that you can walk over and pop in and listen to. All right? A time is coming when no man can work. The sun will go down. We're living in a, in a boom period right now where we can still talk about Jesus, and it's not going to cost us too much in terms of punishment. But if you look at my body of work about Black History Month, you're going to discover something. Despite the absence of pigmentation rising to the surface of my skin. Despite me being, what do the kids call it, melanin challenged? <laughs> when it comes to Black History Month, when it comes to celebrating and educating about the subject, the preacher standing in front of you, though the secular world would call me a white dude, I don't have to take a back seat to any preacher in Minneapolis, in St. Paul, in Bloomington, in Duluth, in Rochester. You can go over to Chicago if you want. I'm right in the thick of things throwing down for this subject because it matters. There are reasons why you're sitting in this place, and if you're listening abroad on some kind of radio or whatever, there are reasons why you're listening to me right now. Sunday night, February, any you guys could be out, you know, watching television, watching sports. You could be out eating. You could be at another church's Sunday night service, Sunday night Bible study. But you are here, and it's not an accident you've made that choice. I'm grateful. But inside of you, you know why you're here. It's because, like Arrested Development, like Tennessee, you are still thirsty. And this is the place where the messages are being proclaimed that are, that are giving the content that's going to satisfy the thirst and the hunger for the Word of God. As you're starting to learn, the broadcast segment of our Sunday evening worship service is a three-act play, all right? It's made up of three different parts. Number one, and for those of you in front of me, obviously you got your program, so it's a diagram for you, but I'm just going over this for the listeners. Uh, number one, pulpit remarks slash announcements. Part two is ask a preacher anything slash Q&A. And part three is the word slash the message. I'm gonna run the format by you again. As adults, our brain is not as spongy as it once was, and we learn by repetition. Part one of the broadcast segment of the Sunday evening service. Part one is pulpit remarks slash announcements. Part two is ask a preacher anything slash Q&A. And part three is the word slash message. Let's get right into part number one. Time is not our friend this evening, although I'm going to try to take my time. Pulpit remarks slash announcements, and we've got four of them. 
uh, number one out of four. As you can see, looking around, we're in a different building today than we were last time. This is because Sovereign Grace Baptist Church has not, at least as of yet, signed any lease deal with any particular place. We haven't found our forever home yet, but don't, don't uh, panic or anything because this church is so new, it's so young, that uh, it's able, it, it should, you should be able to understand it, you know what I mean? It's not like uh, Rome was built in a day. I personally, as the pastor, as the shepherd, I'm not in a rush to enter my sheep, to enter my, my people into any entanglement until such a time as God declares, this is my will for your people, right? I haven't heard that. I haven't felt that about any situation. I can remember when I was just a dude in the pews or when I was an associate minister, I was at a church and that church that I was a part of was renting their space from another church. And the landlord church who owned the building, they felt some type of entitlement, some type of claim, some type of... Uh, what do you want to call it, right to have a say-so over what the renting church that I was a member of was and was not allowed to preach. And I remember thinking to myself that the pastor that I was sitting under who entered into a deal where the church he was renting from had control over him was extremely stupid, was very irresponsible. And I, I watch sometimes to see how it's done and sometimes to see what not to do. And this is an example where I saw from an older preacher what not to do. I'm not willing to have oratorical or homiletical handcuffs put on me by some jackass who has no trouble accepting a monthly rent check from me, but then wants to try to tell me what I can do with the space that I have. If I am paying for the time in the sanctuary, and it's my time in the sanctuary, guess what I'm going to preach in the sanctuary? Whatever the heck I want. Whatever God lays on my mind, whatever God lays on my heart, whatever God lays on my soul, whatever God lays on my conscience, whatever God instructs me that the people need to hear, that's what I'm going to say. And I'm not checking with anybody, especially someone that I have paid. They can get out of my way, but they can't tell me anything. So it's not just a facility that we're evaluating. Does the building have air conditioning? What is the bathroom like, etc.? We're evaluating an entire situation that has a lot of moving parts to it. I have no doubt that at the appointed time when God sees fit and he already knows when that's going to be and what the circumstances are going to be, he's going to open a door so wide and so obvious that no amount of human effort could ever close it and we'll have no choice but to join hands and walk right up into it. Until then... Right now, we're going to be the vagabonds of the Twin Cities, and we're going to meet where we can. And uh, I have no trouble with that. Announcement number two out of four. As you can see, it's been a month since we last met at our last service, and the question has been asked, why aren't you meeting every single Sunday like every other church on the planet? My answers were building up to that. Right now, until further notice, we're going to be meeting for worship once a month. I've got reasons. You have to crawl before you can walk, brothers and sisters, and you have to walk before you run. It's baby steps. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. We're not thinking of the current move. We're thinking four moves down the chessboard. There's pieces to the puzzle. I can't say the full deal at this exact second, but everybody who knows me knows that there's always a reason why I do everything. There's always a method to my madness. Everything I do has a purpose Hold your horses and stay tuned, all right? Announcement number three out of four. For those of you that don't already know, this is a closed church. I know when you go to the big white mega church where the pastor's 30 years old and he's wearing jeans and he's wearing sneakers and he's got a shirt open, right? And um, they've got a laser light show and a rock and roll band and a PowerPoint presentation where you can see the words to the songs on the, on the screen and where you can see the words to the sermon on uh, the Bible verses on the screen where there's a coffee shop in the, in the waiting room or whatever, uh, you know. Um, those churches, they always, the trend is the open church. You got to have the church open, open. And I'm like, open to what? Open to all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff that a baby church can't afford to be open to right now. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
During its infancy, as we lay down the foundation, attendance, at least in the physical, it, the people in front of me, is by invitation only. So if you're here, look around. Um, I either invited you personally or you were third party vouched for by a person that I invited personally. Is it always going to be this tight? No. Why is it like that now? There's about a dozen reasons I could spit out at you. And if I really thought about it, probably two dozen. One of which is security. Do you hear what I'm saying? When, when the world is in love with lies and you take a mic and tell the truth, there's going to be some backlash. And you have to be in a position where you can provide protection from and a response to backlash. We're going to be underground for a very short season at the beginning. For the first year at least, possibly the first two years, while we build the infrastructure upon which the superstructure of a God-honoring, Christ-exalting, gospel-preaching family and, and church fellowship can be built. Down the road, when everyone in Minneapolis knows the name of Sovereign Grace Baptist Church, some of you are going to be able to say, I was down from day one, when it was still a well-kept secret, right? But in the meantime, I mean, we have audio, we're going to be putting them out to the public square, the world can listen in other formats, but in terms of physically showing up, we got to keep it tight, all right? <clears throat> Finally, announcement number four of four. Our first service, attendance was low. There were less people in the room for that one than are in the room for this one. So at least here, attendance has increased just a little bit. But that message has been heard by several people and more people hear it every day. And feedback is trickling in. I think I get messages every other day. And uh, whenever I'm preparing to speak, if you know me, I always tell you my goal is twofold. To comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Do you hear what I'm saying? To comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. The message we did last time, it spoke the truth to a generation that is held captive by and is in love with lies. And to many people, it was a shock to the system. And when people get a shock to the system, it wakes them up from their slumber. You ever woke them up, someone up from a dead sleep? They're either happy you woke them up or they're angry that you woke them up. All I can tell you is that that message, based on the feedback that's trickled in, it blessed those that it was meant to bless and it upset those that it was meant to upset. But God was glorified, Christ was magnified, the saints were edified, the scriptures were proclaimed, and that's all you can ask. There were praise reports that have been messaged in, right? One lady called it the first breath of fresh air that she'd heard out of a church in 20 years. The churches you've been going to the last 20 years suck, honey, but that's all right. Uh, another one was a guy saying he learned more from the Ask a Preacher Anything slash Q&A session we did than he'd learned in the past five years in a Sunday school class combined. I got two messages calling me arrogant because if you know the truth and you're confident in its truthfulness, people are like, how dare you act like you know the truth? You're so arrogant. If someone's not calling you arrogant, you might not be telling the truth. So two messages of people calling me arrogant. Three messages saying that I hate people. I'm an Islamophobe and I'm a homophobe. Um, that seems to be the theme. And whatever the heck a xenophobe is, I think that's the catch-all when they don't know what to call you. But so, so two messages calling me arrogant. Three saying I hate people. But only one threat of physical violence. I must be losing my touch. I thought I would have gotten more threats. Um, but at least these threats came from Muslims and not my other Christian brothers. So that's good. Because yes, I've gotten threats from Christians. So God needs to be praised because even though we've only had one service, we've moved the needle just a little bit. We have a message and at least on the smallest microcosmic level, at least a few people are listening to that message and that gives me a shaving of a pinky nail, of a door cracked open, of hope. And that hope is going to keep us on moving. And as a family, we have the potential to make an impact, not just on Minneapolis, but on the world. And so those are my uh, uh, announcements. And so we're done with that. Moving on to Act 2 or Part 2. 
Ask the Preacher Anything slash Q&A. Now, last time I did this, we had six submissions, four of which were usable. This time, we've had nearly 24 submissions. I could have a whole message where all I do is answer questions, but then there'd be no message. There'd be no Bible expounded upon. And so uh, I want you to store in the back of your brain, I'm going to impregnate this question into your mind. If I was to ever do a service where we don't have a sermon, but I dedicate it to answering questions, 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 would, would you be open to that one time or not? Uh, if you feel robbed, the word's not being expounded on, fine. Uh, we won't do it that way. I'll just have these questions build up in a backlog. Um, but uh, if you feel like you could tolerate that, I think it could be fun. But I'm going to leave it in the hands of the people. So out of the 24, I'm not going to knock out 24, but I have eight of them. I think, depending on time, we'll see where we are at um, when I'm done knocking out a few. Um, I'm going to get... I'll just knock them out here. Uh, question number one out of the eight, is Sovereign Grace Baptist Church either part of a specific denomination or planning to become part of one? To write this question, you had to write the name of my church, and to write the name of my church, you had to write the word Baptist. Okay, so you answered one of the questions, one of the parts of your question, in your question itself. This is a Baptist church. In terms of becoming part of a specific denomination, I was converted in the Minnesota State Baptist Convention, okay? Uh, I was raised in the Minnesota State Baptist Convention, trained in the Minnesota State Baptist Convention. Um, I would like for us to join that at some point, if they will have us. There are great things that are happening in the Minnesota State Baptist Convention, which for those of you listening in a broader on the recordings or whatever. Minnesota State Baptist Convention is the Minnesota branch of the National Baptist Convention. Um, so we would love to join that. Um, like I said, there's some good things happening. There's also some things that are not good. And, um, but overall, these are the people that have produced me and uh, by proxy have produced you if you're sitting under me. And I would like to do that. It's very important that if you have a church, you should have some kind of covering you should be linked up with some other churches. Uh, Christianity is not a lone ranger. It's not a lone wolf type of religion, all right? Um, you have to, so you're not off the reservation. No church is an island. If I start preaching, hey, let's all shuffle, let, you know, let's all cut the heads off of chickens and dance around this table in a silly hat, I need preachers around me who are going to come and say, hey, get, get, you know, get right or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Um, but if I'm over here in a vacuum, independent and autonomous, um, uh, from a, from a covering, there's no one that's going to know that. And I'm going to be over here doing crazy crap. Now I do believe in the autonomy of the local church. So I will never join a denomination where our church becomes absorbed by some hierarchical Roman Catholic style structure, like you see in the church of God in Christ, where the local elder He's only the elder for a certain, he, he has, um, there, there's a glass ceiling where he'll hit it and he'll run into the bishop. All right, there's bishops, um, district superintendents, blah, blah, blah. You've got this Roman Catholic hierarchical structure, except their Vatican City is in Memphis, Tennessee. I will never join something like that where someone thinks they're higher than us and tries to tell us something. We're going to remain an independent church, but we're going to voluntarily fellowship with the Baptists if they will have us. Uh, question number two out of eight, what about social justice? I could do a whole message just on that question alone. Uh, what about social justice is a short question. Last time I was here, I criticized a question for being too long. I could criticize this one for being too short, but uh, basically, <coughs> here's the deal. Um, if something terrible takes place in the city, I think the church should be leading the way in terms of calling people who commit acts of injustice to account. All right. Um, we should show up if there's a, a kid gets run over by a car because this unregulated four way stop. We should be marching and demanding that there's a speed bump, a stop sign, something like that. 
You also have to understand that a few days into it, if there's a special interest group that sees your outrage and smells the chance for money or power or notoriety, they will come in from outside of the community and try to hijack what you're doing. And you have to be prepared for that. So in, in Marxist and Leninist writings, there's a position called the red agitator. This is a person who uh, has the, the bully pulpit, if you will, and through the language of the revolution and the language of the liberation, they call out to the proletariat in the code words that those people who are trained in it will understand. When that person shows up, it's time to go, all right? Um, you got to think of this. <clears throat> the agitator that's on the corner with his bow tie and his megaphone, and he's in front of the camera discussing something. You have to be able to listen to his message, but you have to look past him, okay? The thing you need to ask about that agitator is, does this man have a wife? Does he have kids? Uh, do they have pets? Do they have a grocery bill? Do they have rent or a mortgage, right? Do they have a heat bill? Do they have air conditioning bill, electric, uh, whatever, garbage removal, water bill, medical, dental, vision, 401k? Do they got to buy their kids clothes? Do they got to get out of the house once a month for some entertainment? Is there a car note? Is there auto insurance? If it's Tuesday afternoon at 2 o'clock and there's a protest going on, one thing that agitator's not doing is out there shuffling in the secular business world trying to secure these things for his family. What does that mean? It means he's professionally standing there. Someone somewhere is paying him. You have to look past him to see the paymaster. Do you understand? Um, when you see the peaceful protest become a riot and you realize that the people who came from out of state are the ones smashing the windows. When the television camera's rolling and when the TV reporter's flapping his lips, he's not making a distinction between the out of town professional agitator and you who are legitimately displeased. All the community is being painted with this broad brush. And you gotta understand when you see the person pretending to be a white supremacist and the person pretending to be a black supremacist traveling together and getting off the same bus at the same time, you're like, how can that be? Because they're working for the same paymaster. Their paycheck is being cut. So when you're looking at someone who's funded by the Soros Foundation or the Clinton Foundation, you're dealing with people um, who have an agenda that is to advance some kind of narrative be it political leftism, economic leftism, the Christian is not to be used as the frontline pawn to carry the bucket for that. But on its face, yes, if something terrible happens, the Christian is the only one who has the absolute uh, standard of right and wrong, moral and immoral, justice and injustice, to where we can even say with absolute certainty that thing is screwed up. No one else can really say that. So but we are made in the image and likeness of a just God. And when something icky happens, we should be displeased and we should tell the truth about it. We should also know when it's time to leave that particular event. Um, and the word social justice sometimes is a code word for communism, for Marxism, things of that nature. Be very careful. Don't be used by some other person. All right, they're going to sit there from their ivory tower calling shots and writing they're the marketing department of the corporation that's financing the agitator. They're writing the slogans that are coming out of his mouth. All right. Be very careful because there's, there's a bigger picture. Don't miss the bigger picture. Um, let's see. Next question. I heard a preacher say that Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. Number one, is this true? And number two, if it is true, then why? This person snuck in a, two questions. Only one per customer. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, did Jesus talk more about hell than he did about heaven? Yes. At least if you take the accounts that are given to us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are, are not exhaustive, obviously, but the things they chose to record under the inspiration of God, yes, Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. Why? Because more people are going to hell than are going to heaven. 
Um, and people get upset when I say that, but broad is the path that leads to destruction. There's a lot of stuff that's included in that broad, wide path. It's easy to get to. Narrow is the path to heaven, you see. And so um, we choose the narrow road, but Jesus discusses the broad road because it deserves more of a warning and because people get upset when I say this too, the vast majority of humankind is gonna end up in hell. The vast majority. God has saved, chosen to save a remnant. There's a finite number of people that God the Father has given in an offering to God the Son, all right? And so, um, yes, I hope that clears up that question. Uh, let's see here. Do you think it's more important to have a religion or a relationship? God help me. Um, in the 1970s in American Christianity, it became trendy to make this dichotomy. Uh, what's a dichotomy? Die means two, right? Uh, taking something that exists as a whole and making this fast, hard, cold division, splitting it into two things. You make a dichotomy. So if you take the entire Christian worldview and split it into religion versus relationship, in logic, there's such a fallacy or an error called false dichotomy. It means you're splitting something into two that doesn't deserve to be split into two. And so as a Christian, I would reject the religion slash relationship dichotomy they've chosen to make. And my basis for that is if you have your Bibles with you, James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, depending on your translation, it'll sound like this. If anyone thinks that he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but instead deceives himself, his religion is worthless. A religion that is pure and stainless, according to God the Father, is this, to take care of orphans and widows who are suffering, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So in these two verses, it talks about a worthless religion, and then it talks about a religion that's pure and stainless. And so religion is just the fleshing out and the practicing of the faith that you have inside of you, all right? It's an entire mentality. It's an entire lifestyle. You eat it, you dream it, you sleep it. But um, if you have, you know, if you can't control your speaking, then um, it's worthless. It's not doing anything for you is the idea. But the fact that James, who's the half-brother of Jesus, mind you, okay, he's the natural son of Mary and Joseph. Sorry to disappoint all the Eastern Orthodox people or the Roman Catholic people who think Mary was a perpetual virgin. Her and Joseph did something to make James. What do you think that was? Don't make me teach the class, please. But, um... Here's the deal. Can you imagine being James and being raised by Mary? Jesus never gets in trouble. You know what I mean? Jesus cleans up after himself. Jesus doesn't, uh, you know, consort with those boys. And why can't you be more like your brother Jesus? Can you imagine how upset James would have been growing up with God the Son as his older brother that he could never be, he, you know, he could, he's living in the shadow of such a person. Anyways, James uses the word religious. If anyone thinks that he is religious... Okay, and then it's, you get a religion that is pure and stainless, a religion that is worthless. James uses religion, the word, all right, it's there. So um, I know that in the 70s it became popular, like I said, to make this distinction. I don't want a religion, I want a relationship. And for some reason, even by the 1990s and into the, I think I heard someone say it in the 2020s, it refuses to die. But um, do I think it's more important to have a religion or a relationship? It's important to have both, and I refuse to make a, a separation between the two. I have a religion and a relationship with God, and I don't see them at war with each other at all. I know that when you're proclaiming to the Roman Catholics, you say, well, all you have is a religion. You stand up for the statue. You kneel down for the statue. You stand up for the wafer. You kneel down for the wafer. You sit down. You sing, Amen, Amen. And it's this dead orthodoxy where you go through the motions and you say, that's religion, but I have a relationship. I would use more responsible terminology when you're referring to their dead orthodoxy in terms of life practice. 
versus your living, breathing access to God and a personal relationship. I just wouldn't trash the word religion simply because if James, the half-brother of Jesus, didn't trash the word, then who are you to trash the word? Um, uh, next question. I want to participate in ancient African... Oh, if I want to participate in ancient African voodoo and witchcraft religious and cultural beliefs, would you join other black American preachers in calling it satanic or demonic? Yes. Um, here's the deal. Uh, the, the dude standing in front of you, I'm what the secular world would call a white dude. If you break me down in terms of what the world would call race or ethnicity, uh, Irish, German, French, native, in that order, but without regard to which of these you follow, at some point, my great-great-great-great-grandparents were involved in some kind of non-Christian religious worldview, okay? So whether it's in Ireland where they're talking about leprechauns and knocking on trees, you know, knock on wood to free up the spirits to try to have a good day, or the Celtic paganism, or the worship of the trees and, and the wind and stuff like that, um, you know, Native American spirituality where they just call it creator, but a previous generation called it the great spirit. Um, you name it, I claim it. At some point in everyone's history, there's a great, 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 great ancestor that participated in something that the Bible says demonstrates that you are, uh, it's, not the, it's not the search for spirituality, it's the running away from spirituality towards whatever. So if your ancestor was shuffling chicken bones to, to try to see the future, you know, and jumping across the broom into the spirit world to talk to the spirit guide or participating in voodoo and hoodoo and all this stuff. This was a person that didn't have the 66 scrolls that you did, right? And so the thing is, do you love your ancestors? Yes. Are you here because of them? Yes. Did they overcome great things? Yes. Did they produce great things? Yes. Do you love them enough to go to hell for them? All right. I met my great grandmother. Uh, she lived to be 93. She died in 87. So she was born in the late 1800s. Met her one time. She cursed us out in German. And when one of us was sick, she gave, she gave us um, brandy as a, as a medicine. Right. That's old school German. This woman's a Roman Catholic. She's praying to saints. Pray to this saint when you lose your keys. Pray to this saint when you're having a rough day. I don't sit here and try to tease myself and, and, and she's probably in heaven. I'm not going to do that, you know. You must hear of and believe in God the Son, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You must receive it and you must repent from and turn away from the religious systems and practices that you formerly held to. You have to. And so, yes, if you are now a Christian... And then you decide, well, my ancestors believed in, in this. And you chase after that based on some emotional loyalty to some people that you really haven't met before because you share blood with them or because you share a common his, history and heritage and culture. If you adopt a non-Christian religion, you're, it means you were never genuinely a Christian to begin with. They, well, they went out from us, but they were never really of us because if they had been of us, they would have remained with us but they left so that it might be made manifest that they were never really of us. If you leave Christianity, it means you were never here to begin with. It means you were a fraud. Okay? But no, um, I love my ancestors. You should love your ancestors. You should try to learn something from history. But you have 66 scrolls of information from God that they didn't have. And you should not pretend that you don't have it. And you shouldn't feel guilty about utilizing it any more than you don't feel guilty about utilizing a computer or an airplane that your ancestors didn't have. You have more knowledge than they did. And so thus you have the information of who God is and what he requires of you and the things they practiced. You turn away from them and you turn towards him. So yes, I would stand right beside any American, any black American preacher that calls voodoo and hoodoo and African paganism satanic and demonic. Yes, I would, I would agree. Uh, let's see. Was the Bible used by white slave masters to keep black slaves more subservient and obedient? If not, why do I hear so many people say so? If so, what is your response? 
Well, um, the concept of slavery uh, existed in ancient Middle East, ancient Africa. Um, it existed in the world. It was, it was a reality. It was never questioned whether or not it was moral or immoral until it got to Christian-dominated countries. The Christian-dominated countries are the people who believe that man is made in the image and likeness of God. They're the first ones in the history of the world to even ask the question and wrestle with it. No one else had before that it was just a given. Now, in terms of the slave trade in the United States of America, if you look at the abolition movement, who was it but the, the, the Puritans? Who was it but the Quakers? Who was it but the Protestants and the Baptists? Literally, the Civil War was preachers with the Bible in one hand and a gun in the other hand. Do you understand what I'm saying? The Christian is always the one who said human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. And on the basis of that, they're intrinsically beautiful, full of uh, 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 civil rights that are conferred upon them at the moment of conception by the God that made them. And it was our duty to enshrine them. And uh, it was a process that took place, obviously. But um, the 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 people who perpetuated it, number one, they were Roman Catholic. And yes, I'll make a distinction between myself and a Roman Catholic all day. Who do you think the Catholics were killing in the Inquisition? They were killing me. So yes, I, I separate from them. So the Spaniard carrying the Roman Catholic tradition began it on this continent, this hemisphere. Uh, it was advanced by people who held to a naturalistic and a humanistic philosophy. And yes, at some point they said, you know what, the only basis in terms of morality, absolutely, and telling someone what's right and wrong, you have to have a concept of God. So the humanist and the naturalist and all these things, they would take a Bible because it was the basis for morality. And yes, they would, they would splice it. I have the, the slave Bible. Any reference to a person having civil rights or rights to freedom is removed. These are white people doing this in the colonial states of America, but these are not genuine Christians. Okay, the genuine Christians are the ones who did the abolition, who did the Underground Railroad. All right, um, that's who it was. Um, the, the closest illustration I have is this, and I just made this up this morning. I don't even know if it works. You have to tell me. <clears throat> if I'm a mathematician and I publish the greatest mathematics book that will advance civilization and technology and someone somewhere takes my book and they build a bomb and that bomb goes off and it kills 20 million people does the fact that someone took my mathematics book and used it in a way other than how I intended it erase in any way the claims of my math book that 1 plus 1 is 2 is 8 times 8 equals 64 discredited because someone took my math book and did something that I wasn't, that it wasn't made to do? No. Is the Bible automatically discredited because some people did this? No. So um, it's not a good argument that it was used to keep black slaves subservient. It's really the white slave master. Jesus Christ was a Semitic man of color in the Middle East. Okay, Moses, who wrote the first five books, was a Semitic man of color, but he was raised in the Pharaoh's house. The author of the first five books of the Bible grew up in a black home. To try to call this the white man's religion means you're extremely stupid. And uh, to hear it done in 2024, when that argument has been destroyed thoroughly, is quite remarkable. And I, I don't know how people get away with it. Um, but I guess... Uh, people keep saying so because it works. You know, if the average person is living with their mother and they're porn addicted and they're marijuana addicted and they look at the internet for 15 hours a day, their IQ and their attention span are low and any argument sounds like a good one. And when someone loves their sin, when someone loves their lies, they got to get rid of Christianity. So they pull this out of their behind. Christianity is the white man's religion. And it was used by white slave masters to keep black slaves subservient and obedient. Because in the next logical step in the progression is we got to get you out of this and more in touch with 
uh, Pan-African paganism and Egyptian paganism and stuff like that. It's a satanic deception and you should not fall for it, all right? Christianity is a Middle Eastern religion proclaimed by people of color from the beginning. Uh, don't let anyone tell you anything different. Uh, let's see, we got two left. We're doing pretty good. Are you willing to, wow, how this, I must have been feeling generous that I allowed this one to live. Um, are you willing to admit that 1 John 5, 7 was added to the Bible at the Council of Nicaea? <laughs> Anytime you're discussing religion or theology with a person and they pull the Council of Nicaea out of their behind, <clears throat> here's, a, here's a trick for you. Ask them, okay, name me the top five scholars you've read on the, on the historical context of the Council of Nicaea. They will be silent. You'll hear crickets chirping. They haven't read anything. They say the word Council of Nicaea and it's meant to scare you and it's meant to make you think that they're more intelligent than they are. Like they're blindsiding you with stuff that you wouldn't know. Because really right now, if you think about today's Sunday, how many Sunday schools and how many churches in Minneapolis were discussing any of the stuff we're talking about? Zero, I promise so they count on the fact that you, being a Christian, are probably a simple person, and they say the word Council of Nicaea, and then they declare victory. But really, if you press them, they haven't read three pages of discussion about the subject. Let me tell you about the Council of Nicaea. <coughs> um, the subjects that were discussed at the Council of Nicaea were the deity of Christ and the Trinity. That's it. When you talk to one of these fools, they'll tell you the Council of Nicaea was when Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the state of Rome. The Council of Nicaea is when they decided what books would be in the Bible. The Council of Nicaea is when they changed stuff. You're too stupid to breathe. I'm surprised that you can tie your shoes when you're, when you got a big destroyed brain flopping around in your skull. If you can tie your shoes, I'm, I'm a... Anyways, dealing with people like this it's almost like you got to lower your IQ 30 points just to hang with them. They're, they're anti-Christian bigotry. What does the scripture say? Professing to be wise, they became fools, right? They want you to believe that there's some scholar, but they're very stupid. And you can tell this by listening to them. Uh, the verse he's talking about, 1 John 5, 7, the King James translation. 1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. It is true that when you look up 1 John 5, 7 in any other English translation, that verse is not there. I'm about to tell you the story about the, the verse, okay? Um, king James was the king of England, and when the church and the state are one, Sometimes the church instructs the state what to do, and sometimes the state instructs the church what to do, and it's a bad marriage. But the Protestant reformers in 1604 went up to King James and said, we want to make the Geneva Bible the official Bible of England. Will you please decree it? He looked at it, and it was so Protestant and so reformed that he nearly, he, he was like, no way. So in response to that uh, Geneva Bible, he commissioned a translation committee and uh, the edict he gave was don't have the final result be anything that contradicts the teachings of Roman Catholicism. Fine. So they get together and they do the King James translation. Don't use the word version. All right. That's a, that's a misnomer. It's not a King James version. It's a King James translation. And since they did it in 1611, that means for 1,600 years before this was done, there was a completed manuscript of the New Testament. And for tens of thousands of years before that, there was a completed manuscript of the Old Testament. So if something happens in England 1,600 years after the fact, are there not copies and copies and copies and copies that pre-exist that to where the accuracy of King James can be checked? Yes. All right, so don't let anyone try to get ignorant with you about King James translations. But anyway, so they, they do this translation. 1 John 5, 7, basically, here's the deal. If you wanted a copy of 
1 John, there was no Kinkos or whatever. I'm dating myself now. Kinkos doesn't exist. There's no Federal Express stores where you could walk in or an Office Max and say, hey, I'd like 40 copies of this. Okay, they didn't have such technology. There was no printing press. If I, for my family, wanted a scroll of 1 John, I had to pay a scribe to copy it by hand. I had to purchase the, the paper, the ink, and the pen, and I had to uh, make sure that I paid him, compensate him for his time. Now, these scribes were not just scribes. Sometimes they were scholars. And at some point, they're doing hand copies, and they're using the previous one as the basis for their copy. And it goes on a long line of transition, all right, down through the years, copies of copies of copies. At some point, a guy reaches 1 John 5, and on the side, he puts a Bible study note. How many of you all have um, study Bibles? Uh, so I could say, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And on the side, I could write, this is the verse where the gospel is summed up. If someone later takes my study note on the side and can't make the distinction between my study note and the verse, and they include my study note in their copying of the, of the verse, then what happens? All of a sudden, there's a verse in here. That's what happened here. Some scribe somewhere was trying to offer a commentary as to what the verses meant, a summary. And the summary he offered doesn't contradict any piece of Christian literature, any Christian uh, theology, creed, whatever. It's the historic position. He's just putting a bow on it and putting it in a, you know, in a summarizing kind of way. Well, obviously, someone who was copying First John and using that as the source began to throw that in there as though it was part of the verse. Then every copy after that that was dependent on that had that as part of the verse. It's kind of like what happened on Mark chapter 16. How many of you all know that uh, Mark chapter 16, the gospel of Mark ends after verse 8. So what happens is someone's copying Mark and copying Mark and copying Mark. Then there's a scholar one day who decides to put a study note and uh, verses 9 through 20, when someone copies Mark and they use him as the source, you understand, they, they take his study notes and make it the ending of Mark. No responsible preacher will ever preach the last verses of Mark because they're not in the oldest Greek manuscripts. We have the old Greek manuscripts to, to compare this against. And so we've learned, yes, 1 John 5, 7, it was not added at the Council of Nicaea. It's, um, it's, it's specific to the King James translation, which used uh, whatever Greek manuscript was, you know, that, that had that happen. But yeah, it's in there. Um, it's not part of the oldest manuscripts. Everybody knows this. My faith is not threatened by it. Your faith should not be threatened by it. It just means that someone made a copying error. They threw in a Bible study note as though it's the verse. And we have... Like I said, copies of 1 John that pre-exist that happening where we can compare it. And uh, my translation, well, like if I use the ESV or the ISV or the NASV, they don't have that copying error in it. They, they've used manuscripts that come from before that happened. All right. Uh, last question here. When I turn, this one's long. When I turn 18 and graduate, I'm considering joining the military. But Exodus 2013 says, thou shalt not kill. What if there's a war? Can I be in the military and be a conscientious objector at the same time? Will my faith get me into trouble? Well, um, Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, the word uh, for kill, there's many ways to say kill in Hebrew. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Moses could have used any one of them, but he used ratza. Okay, ratza is specific because it means premeditated homicide. So accurately, Exodus 20, 13 should be, thou shalt not commit premeditated homicide. So an, an ex-girlfriend that did you dirty, you should not be hanging out outside of her house, learning her patterns. She jogs at this time. She walks her dog at this time. She goes to the, the job at this time, plotting how you're going to eventually kill her, right? Or whoever... That's premeditated homicide. 
You are not to commit premeditated homicide. All right. Rots is never used of capital punishment. So for those of you who say, I don't believe in capital punishment because thou shalt not kill. Uh, the verse is never used. Premeditated homicide is never used of capital punishment because God approves of capital punishment and some people deserve it, but that's another conversation. Um, you are not to commit premeditated homicide. Now, um, if you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, uh, the first verse says, There is a season for everything and a time for every event under heaven. He has made everything appropriate in its time. Another way to say it, he's made everything beautiful in its time. Okay, in verse 11. So, every event that takes place because God is an essentially good God and he's working out uh, a plan in human history that's going to end in his glorification, okay? Everything that takes place in that plan is beautiful from where he's sitting, okay? Um, and if you remember the song from the 60s, to everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. And a time for every purpose under heaven. Don't make me sing it, right? Time to go on, a time to die. And they're singing, it's the hippies, they're all at Woodstock, you know, doing mushrooms and all kinds of nastiness. But when you get to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 3 says, a time to kill. So you think of the Sandra Bullock and Matthew McConaughey and Sam Jackson movie, a time to kill. That movie is named after Ecclesiastes 3.3. 3. There is a time to kill and God's working out of his beautiful plan in history. Verse 8, there is a time for war. There is a time for war. It says God is working out a beautiful plan and everything is beautiful in its season, in its time. And there is a time to kill. Ecclesiastes 3.3. 3. There's a time for war. Ecclesiastes 3.8. Uh, we're Baptists in this room and Baptists come out of the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestant Reformation had an entire doctrine called the just war theory. Uh, one day if God permits, I'm going to break down the just war theory. There's a time when you have to provide some civil disobedience. There's a time when you have to go to war to defend your person, your property, your family, your honor, your life, whatever. And so uh, when, when you have reservations about the possibility of joining the military, I would be less concerned about the fact that I'm going to join the military, but I don't want to kill people. That's like, I'm going to join the Air Force, but I don't want to fly a plane. Well, that's what you sign on to do, right? So I would be less concerned about that because God's not upset if you have to kill someone in war. But what you should be upset about is look who the commander in chief is. Is there anyone more sold out and compromised in your life? Would you want to be put on the front lines of the military industrial complex warmongering lobby to be in some unjust conflict to advance the Pax Americana across the planet and make some kind of evil empire? I'd be more worried about that. And that's why military recruiting is at an all-time low right now because the possible candidates, they look at who the commander-in-chief is and because he got into office through controversial and suspicious circumstances, much of America doesn't even view him as legitimately installed. This is an election year, 2024, and there's a possibility that could be fixed. But I would be more concerned about that than the fact that if you're in the military, you might have to kill him. Brothers and sisters, we just knocked out eight questions, all right? And in this short, and I could have done each one of these for a long time, okay? But I bet you learned more in this session than you would have in a lot of places. And now we're on part three of the broadcast portion of our service, the word slash the message. I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as I can on the one hand, but I'm going to take my time on the other hand. If you got somewhere else to be, don't let the door hit you in the behind on the way out. But I'm going to do the word. Is that all right? We're coming out of Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34, the first 10 verses. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 1 through 10. They read like this. A message came from Yahweh for me, 
And it had this to say, Son of man, prophesy against Israel's shepherds. Tell those shepherds, this is what Adonai Yahweh says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves and not the sheep. Shouldn't shepherds feed the sheep? You're eating the best parts, clothing yourselves with the wool, and slaughtering the homegrown sheep without having fed the sheep. You haven't strengthened the weak, set broken bones, regathered the scattered, or looked for the lost. Instead, you've dominated them with brutal force and ruthlessness. Since they have no shepherd, they've been scattered around and have become prey for all sorts of wild animals. How scattered they are. My sheep have gone wandering on all the mountains, on all the hills, and throughout every high place in the whole world, with no one to look for them or go out in search of them. Therefore, listen to what Yahweh says, you shepherds. As certainly as I'm alive and living, my sheep have truly become victims. Food for all the wild animals, because there are no shepherds. My shepherds did not go searching for my flock. Instead, the shepherds fed themselves, but my flock they would not feed. Therefore, you shepherds, listen to what Yahweh says. This is what Adonai Yahweh says. Watch out. I'm coming after you, shepherds. I'm going to demand my sheep back from their hand and fire them as shepherds. The shepherds won't be shepherds anymore when I snatch my flock right out of their mouths so they can't be eaten by them anymore. Title of the message, Confronting Black Liberation Theology. Confronting Black Liberation Theology. Bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time together. Our Father and our God, we come to you in awestruck wonder, in adoration of your name. We lift up, we glorify, we magnify your great and holy name in that of your Son, our great God and Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach Baruch Hashem, Jesus of Nazareth. Tonight we observe and acknowledge the journey and the pilgrimage that black Americans, your created people, your image bearers who you made in your likeness, the sons and daughters of Ham, the descendants of the great and advanced Nubian civilizations that shaped the early part of world history, the great, 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 great grandbabies of the kings and the queens of ancient empires originating, originating straight out of the cradle of civilization, what they've been through and what they still go through on this, the North American continent in order to distract your elect from focusing on individually fulfilling the Great Commission in order to charm and captivate the minds and the hearts of the non-elect and point them in the direction of hell. Satan has engineered a brilliant masterpiece as you warned us in Matthew 24, 24, so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. When we see a lie looming large on the horizon of our culture, particularly when it arrives at the doorstep of the church, you have given us the duty to confront it. You've given us the duty to correct it. You've given us the duty to speak the truth about it. You've given us the duty to set the record straight about it. Please send your spirit right now and do for us what you did for the Christians at Ephesus as recorded in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18 and open the eyes of our hearts. Please have him do for us what you did for Lydia as recorded in Acts chapter 16 verse 14 and open our hearts to listen carefully to what is being said. We are engaged in spiritual warfare of the highest order on this evening. Please glorify yourself in this message. Please sovereignly intervene and perform a miracle in the minds, in the hearts, in the lives through the act of your word and your truth going forth with boldness and in power. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, brothers and sisters, this is a message you're not going to hear anywhere else. Keep your hands in the vehicle at all times. It's about to get raw. Spirit, help me. In any race-based preacher hype, in any race-based religious hustle, 
whether you're dealing with the Ku Klux Klan or the British Israelites or the black Israelites or the Nation of Islam or the Morris Science Temple, you find yourself faced with a narrative that's focused on skin and not sin, on race and not grace, on gossip and not gospel, on sociology and not theology taking what the secular world calls race and trying to weaponize it to manipulate people's emotions and control their core belief system, thus altering their values. Once you have the minds and the hearts of the people eating out of the palm of your hand, you've got all power over them. You can get them to do whatever you want them to do. You can get them to think whatever you want them to think. You can get them to believe whatever you want them to believe. You can get them to vote however you want them to vote. Brothers and sisters, it's one thing to have godless communism and atheistic philosophy propagated out on the streets, propagated in the schools, propagated in the arts, propagated on the television, propagated in the music. But when godless communism and atheistic philosophy enter the door of the local church, when it gets behind a pulpit microphone, deliberately distorting the gospel, pointing people in the direction of hell, it is the job of the local shepherd to chase it away with all authority of God, chase it away, beating it on the head with a big stick while you're doing it so that it doesn't show up again to hurt the sheep. Atheism and godless communism repackaged with a cross on it, being sold as the only authentically black American theology is one of the slickest and slyest lies that Satan has ever sold to the community. The bullying tactic employed by Satan's servants of everybody who doesn't bow down and blindly without question accept black liberation theology as the truth, this person is a sellout. This person is an Uncle Tom. This person is a house individual. This person is a coon. This person is a sambo. This person is a tool of so-called white evangelicalism. That whole verbally abusive rhetoric is satanic intimidation. It's demonic coercion designed to frighten you from holding fast to the authority and infallibility of Scripture, designed to terrorize you, designed to threaten you, designed to discourage you from thinking independently of this system, designed to discourage you from thinking independently of the leaders that are seeking to conquer the black community, one mind at a time, one soul at a time, one family at a time. When you make a stand, when you won't allow Satan's religious ideologies to conquer you as an individual, he sends his servants from the community to verbally torment you, to harass you, until you finally cave, till you finally conform, till you finally get in line, till you finally bow down and let the spirit of the age absorb you into a larger unbelieving collective. For starters, I just want you to take a closer look at its name. Black Liberation Theology. The adjective black is shoehorned in as the first word of the name at the beginning because it's a modifier. It's a qualifier. It takes a pre-existing term, liberation theology, and creates a subdivision or branch of it called black. Dr. Shanley, do you mean that before black liberation theology was ever invented, there was a plain old liberation theology that was already here? Yep. Dr. Shanley, do you mean that black liberation theology is the baby, but the already in existence beforehand liberation theology is her mother? Yep. And so I can see, the, at least the people in front of me, I can see the lights coming to your eyes, the bulbs above your head. I can see the mouse on the treadmill moving. I, I can see the look in your face, because I know where, where your mind is at. All this line of reasoning, it, it drops you off at the million dollar question is being begged. Why is it necessary to put black in front of this newer branch of liberation theology and set it apart from its original roots on which it's founded? Are you seated? 
wait for it. You want to know why? Because liberation theology is a white philosophy. I'm going to say it again. Liberation theology is a white theology. How many of you all have ever heard of the cereal Grape Nuts? Grape Nuts is neither grapes nor nuts. It's a cereal. And it's a cereal that's composed or made up of two words that have nothing to do with what's in the box. The same with liberation theology. It's neither liberation nor theology. It's a political, social, and economic uprising. That's it. And when you put black on it, it's not black either. Black liberation theology comes from liberation theology. Liberation theology, when you talk about it in 2024, sometimes it's also qualified. Sometimes it's also modified. Either it's white liberation theology or Western liberation theology, depending on who the speaker is and who the audience is. <clears throat> but the local reverend, the local brother minister, the local elder, the local bishop trying to recruit you to stand in the crowd at his protest, to stand in front of the police, to stand in front of the doggies, to stand in front of the rubber bullets and the pepper spray to advance whatever they're trying to do, that person either doesn't know the things I'm saying to you, or they know them, but they're willing to look the other way because their political and economic agenda are far more important to them than telling the theological truth has ever been. But whether he knows or whether he doesn't know, he sure as hell isn't going to preach to things that I'm preaching to you. He's not going to give you these facts to the people in the pews because these facts are going to set the people in the pews free. And even though it's packaged as freedom to the point of having the word liberation in it, Black liberation theology is not about liberation. It's about bondage. You're taken right back to the Garden of Eden. You've got Satan come up, coming up to you right now saying, did God really say that? Don't you know that him putting this rule over you is actually him trying to hold you back? Don't you know that if you simply disobey God, your eyes are going to be open. Your ears are going to be open. Someone in this room knows what I'm talking about. But whenever something evil is being sold as freedom, whenever something evil is being sold as if you get involved and bite from this, your eyes are going to be open to stuff you've never seen before. Your ears are going to be open to stuff you've never seen before. You're going to have knowledge you never had before. That is the thumbprint of Satan. You're, like I said, you're literally back in the Garden of Eden all over again. So if black liberation theology is the baby, if it's the counterfeit, and it comes from a mama where it got all of its theology and all of its philosophy comes, liberation theology comes out of neo-orthodoxy, right? It was created by rich, elite, white, European, Marxist, communist, atheist, agnostics, skeptics, free thinkers, also German rationalists. Does that sound like Black theology from Africa that you've ever heard. No, it doesn't. But these people, these white people, they understood the Marxist and the Leninist concept that infiltrating the church could be a great platform to spread political and economic propaganda to a built-in audience. They're already sitting in the pews, their ears are already open, and convince them through Christian-sounding sermons that have their terminology and their Bible verses to become the frontline foot soldiers, to become the disposable bucket carriers in the fostering of a violent Marxist revolution on our streets, in our institutions, an ultimate subsequent overthrow of existing political, social, cultural, and economic conditions of a capitalistic, constitution-based representative republic composed of free and voting people. These white people and the corporations and the marketing departments and the, the, the philosophers and the, the psychologists are actually the authors of what we've all been trained to view as black liberation theology. And from their neo-orthodox, yes, white, yes, European uh, pre-existent people, their sources, they have gotten the theology, and not every black liberation preacher holds to every aspect of this, but most of them do. And uh, 
Here, here's the basic theology. It is a rejection of the Trinity, a rejection of the deity of Christ, a rejection of original sin, a rejection of Christ's virgin birth, a rejection of Christ's sinless life, a rejection of Christ's fulfillment of the law, a rejection of Christ's substitutional death, bodily resurrection, physical ascension to heaven, a, a rejection of his future bodily second coming to this world, it is a denial of the immortality of the human soul, a denial of a conscious afterlife in either heaven or hell, a denial of the resurrection of the dead, a denial of the judgment day at the end of the world, a denial of eternal conscious torment of rejectors of, rejectors of Jesus in hell. These are the people who developed the hell is a state of mind. Hell is here on earth. Hell is living in a ghetto on the south side of Chicago. In the 1980s, there was a pop song where the girl sang, Ooh, heaven is a place on earth. These people would be singing, ooh, hell is a place on earth. You see what I'm saying? But does that list of theology sound like anything that your great-grandparents who were Baptists would have ever held to? When these white Marxist European bastards got the epiphany, had the moment where the light went on, that the best proletarian of have-nots that they could possibly recruit if they could only piss them off enough to be trained to want to overthrow their own country were the black Americans. So these folks, they gathered the religious leftism and the economic leftism and the political leftism and the cultural leftism systematized it into a, a kind of theology and they began targeting historically black colleges and seminaries they began targeting historically black denominations of Christianity. They began targeting black preachers, targeting the black church, targeting black Christians, targeting black families, targeting you. A well-financed and highly organized full court press. And it's been going on for almost 100 years. Look where we're standing right now. How's the community doing? We have reaped the plagues of a godless society. Well, brothers, I'm here to tell you today that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The white liberals have flooded our preachers with this liberation theology to the point that we've got our own branch of their garbage, black liberation theology. I say it's time for the old-time religion to push back just a little bit while the black American church still stands because you don't understand how late in the day it is, brothers and sisters. Let's break down the Bible passage. Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 1 and 2. A message came from Yahweh for me, and it had this to say, Son of man, prophesy against Israel's shepherds. Tell those shepherds, this is what Adonai Yahweh says. So Ezekiel is a prophet. Okay, He's a Hebrew man of color. He's in the Middle East. He's not a white dude in Europe. Get that crap out of your head, okay? Ezekiel, Hebrew man of color, in the ancient Middle East, mouthpiece of God, all right? He's in a state of prayer. He's in a state of spiritual ecstasy. He's being commanded by God to take a memo. He's being commanded by God to prepare and deliver a very serious message. And you got to understand, he's in exile. Israel has fallen. You got to picture him. After America, after her wickedness hits her fullness and God has finally had enough and he's tired of it and America gets delivered into the hands of her enemies and we're conquered and all the Christians are killed or if we, if we won't deny Jesus, uh, we're locked up in a FEMA camp, we're locked in a re-education camp, concentration camp, labor camp, gulag. If we're sitting behind barbed wire with people with guns watching us, and we're starving and we're freezing. And all of a sudden I say, hey, I feel led by God to take a mic and talk to you guys while we're sitting in this uh, incarceration. That's kind of what he's doing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Every preacher in our time, there are no prophets today, despite the best wishes of the five-fold ministers of the, of the Neo-Pentecostals. Ha ha, I'm a prophet today. No, you're not. There are no prophets today, but there are preachers. And every preacher who's obedient to God, he gets his marching orders from God. 
If we're prayed up, if we're studied up, if we're walking right spiritually, God in the person of the Holy Spirit not only guides us to the passage that the people sitting under us need to hear broken down, but he nudges us in the direction of the angle from which we're supposed to approach that passage. What do you mean the angle from which we're supposed to approach the passage? There are passages in the Bible that are so rich, so informative, so deep, so multifaceted, that I could preach that same verse, that same set of verses ten times, and no two of those sermons will ever be alike. All those ten sermons will hit a different aspect of that passage because the scriptures are just that deep. They're just that complex. There's just so much in there. You are approaching a cave full of diamonds and gold, all right? There's a lot to it. But anyway, Ezekiel is being commanded to preach what we today would call a negative sermon. It's a, it's a negative sermon. It's a sermon of judgment. It means Joel Osteen and who's the kid with the muscle t-shirts, the T.D. Jakes boy that uh, doesn't believe in the Trinity, Furtick. None of these people would have Ezekiel preach at their church because he's too negative, all right? God had just caused Israel to be put into captivity as his judgment because as a nation they had disobeyed him so much. But before a nation gets so far gone, that God judges them before the wickedness, like I said, reaches its fullness, there's always a time of warning. The leadership's job is to warn the people of what's coming. And the early chapters of Ezekiel are him being called to do those warnings. But because the church and the state were one, the word shepherd includes both secular leaders and religious leaders, right? So you've got priests and prophets, but then you've also got secular people like judges, kings, magistrates, all of them were leaders and all of them had a duty to tell the people and to rule them properly. But when society began to turn away from God, to turn towards wickedness, as shepherds, as leaders, their job was to protect the people and to train the people and to warn the people. They had to pull the nose of the plane up, but they didn't. They slacked on their duty. The people didn't get the life-saving information and the nation went to hell in a handbasket. They got so wicked, so immoral, so stupid that they got conquered. God is telling Ezekiel to preach a sermon that discusses the leaders that allowed the country to crumble and talks about their neglect. And like I said, you got a picture of us sitting in a FEMA camp and I'm sitting there in our starvation telling you Here's what just happened, everybody, because that's what he's doing. Second part of verse 2. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves and not the sheep. Shouldn't shepherds feed the sheep? Now, if you remember your 23rd Psalm when you were a kid, the word shepherd is in there, right? It pictures, it pictures God's relationship to his people. Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not lack anything that I need. Matter of fact, uh, I'm going to write this down. One day I'm going to do a sermon that breaks down the 23rd Psalm in a detailed way because it's more than a memory verse that the kids memorize. It's more than some stuff we read at a funeral when a body's being lowered into the ground. It's precious, all right? It's beautiful. And to be honest, the 23rd Psalm broken down properly, interpreted properly, and, and all details laid bare before you it's more valuable than your last 10 paychecks combined. Anyways, Ezekiel's utilizing that shepherd concept from the 23rd Psalm, but he's turning it on his head because he's using it of false leaders, of leaders who have been off their game, who had the title shepherd, but weren't doing the job shepherd, of leaders who were redirecting resources that were meant to advance the word of God, resources that were meant to help the people and taking that money and advancing their own individual wealth, their own individual status, their own image, their own agenda. They were neglecting the very ones that they had taken oaths and vows to serve and protect. Investments that they should have been making in the growth of their people, they were making in themselves. Both spiritually and physically, they were starving the people. They were robbing the people. Remember one time I was uh, meeting up with a preacher friend of mine, went into his office, I said, what are you up to? I'm working on my sermon. I looked over his shoulder, and he was on a website called sermoncentral.com, which I should not have just given them the publicity. And it's for pastors who are so busy that they don't study the Bible, they don't prepare their sermons. You can go and buy 
or, or use someone's sermons that have already been written for you. That's like a singer singing someone else's lyrics. It's icky. A preacher's sermons need to come as a result of uh, prayerful wrestling with and experiencing the scriptures. The spiritual gift of preaching, teaching takes over, and that's how the sermons are born. This guy was robbed. I said, you're robbing your people by going to that website by preaching a sermon written by another person. Of course, I'm an idiot because when I was younger, I used to write sermons for other preachers, but that's another story. Uh, verse 3. You're eating the best parts, literally the fat, clothing yourselves with the wool and slaughtering the homegrown sheep without having fed the sheep. So not only were they feeding themselves and clothing themselves with resources that belong to God and belong to God's people, but they were doing so with the first and the finest. He's saying you're contributing to the destruction of people that you've invested nothing into. The principle here, even though it's an ancient scroll, can be applied today to our times. Both physical food and spiritual food, hoarding what belongs to God's people, keeping it for yourself, God views this as a sin. It leads to the destruction of the entire community and ultimately society. One person at a time, one church at a time, one family at a time, then it's a community, then it's society, then it's the country. It's the domino effect. It's the butterfly flapping his wings in Hawaii, and then there's a, there's a hurricane in Georgia, right? Verse 4, you haven't strengthened the weak, treated the sick, set broken bones, regathered the scattered, or looked for the lost. Instead, you've dominated them with brutal force and ruthlessness. The priests, prophets, kings, judges, rulers, magistrates, etc. They were to take the tax money, they were to take the tithe money, and alleviate the suffering of the poor and medically treat the sick. They were to advance the word of God with this money, but instead they left the people to suffer in misery, left the people to, 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 to suffer in poverty, left the people to suffer in sickness, left people to suffer in spiritual blindness, spiritual ignorance. Not only that, but they were tyrannical and oppressive in their style of leadership. Every last one of us have experienced a preacher that becomes a mini dictator. Some of you all are joined here because you've left preachers that were mini dictators, right? Some of us have experienced a cop or a judge or a social worker or a school principal or a school teacher that's a mini dictator, right? We call that amateur hour. We call that person a person who abuses their position. We call that person an idiot. We call that person a person that makes God angry. Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 5 and 6. Since they have no shepherd, they've been scattered around and have become prey for all sorts of wild animals. How scattered they are. My sheep have gone wandering on all the mountains, on all the hills, and throughout every high place in the whole world, and no one, with no one to look for them or go out in search of them. Brothers and sisters, a preacher can be so asleep at the wheel that it's the equivalent of no preacher being there at all. And since there's no preacher in the right sense of the word there at all, the parishioners are not fed. They're starved, and on the basis of that starvation, they leave the membership roster. They leave the four walls. They leave the protection of the family of God and their fellow Christians, and they go elsewhere in search of the food that the pastors had a duty to feed them but refused to feed them. they got to fill their belly with something. How scattered they are. Some of them end up at the mosque. Some of them end up in the voodoo and the hoodoo of the West Indies and West Africa. Some of them end up in the Kingdom Hall. Some of them end up in the Apostolic Holiness Temple. Some of them end up in drug culture, smoking pot, shooting needles, popping pills. Some end up in prison. Some end up in county jail. Some end up in the grave. Some end up in West African animism and paganism. Some end up marching at the Gay Pride Parade, the Trans Parade. Some of them end up at the Democratic National Convention. Some end up in the basement of the Masonic Hall, the basement of the Freemasonry Lodge. Some of them end up shuffling tarot cards and reading their horoscope 
talking to demons and celebrating the season of their astrological zodiac sign. Some of them are grown men who spend hours a day playing video games. Some of them end up adopting 1960s race warfare, the cliches of which, yes, written by white liberals. Some of them end up cracking open the Egyptian Book of the Dead, spiritually going backwards in their growth thousands of years to ancient Kemetic paganism, uh, which, are, which were featured the finite deities represented by statues, images like corruptible men and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. The demonic gods that Yahweh Elohim spent the entire book of Exodus whipping their ass. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. Some of them end up on food stamps at the food shelf on section 8. They can't get up. Some of them end up denying there's a higher power altogether and become some, some kind of atheist or agnostic. Some of them are creating smut videos and pictures on OnlyFans or some other crap. Brothers and sisters, we've lost a whole generation. We need to go back out there and rescue our babies. We need to get them out of all of the various crap that they've fallen into and bring them back home to the church. Don't make me bust out Matthew 18 and give you the parable of the lost sheep because you know that I will. Preachers, the ones that are able to hear me, one in this room and then the other ones on the radio, anyone who's able to hear my voice, if you're a preacher, you are part of the reason why the babies are gone. Why won't you go back out in the culture and get them? Remember one time I got a phone call and this girl said on Facebook, there's uh, some kids on what they call the murder station over north on Broadway and Lindale. These two kids, these groups of kids are going to shoot each other. I was at a church and I gathered all the men and said to these babies, these 20 year old kids are going to shoot each other. We have to go down. And I was dis disappointed at how many men, older than the young folks, they're shooting each other. Let them do it. I was really disappointed. I ended up showing up there. I was going to try to de-escalate it, but it already de-escalated before I could get there. But the lack of willingness by my generation and the generation that came before me to go back into the culture and get the babies, I was very disappointed. It's one of the reasons I went solo, and I'm not, I'm not someone else's associate minister anymore. Ezekiel 34, verses 7 and 8. One second. Had to be done. Therefore... Listen to what Yahweh says, you shepherds. As certainly as I am alive and living, my sheep have truly become victims, food for all the wild animals, because there are no shepherds. My shepherds did not go searching for my flock. Instead, the shepherds fed themselves, and my, my flock they would not feed. In many of our churches across America right now, you can stand in the pulpit, you can look out at the assembly, you can look out at the service, and you can observe that maybe 40 people have shown up for the Sunday worship service. But when you look at the actual roster on paper, there's 500 members. 90% of them ain't showing up no more. When you look at the old photo albums, the place was flourishing, church picnics, multiple generations, you know, hundreds of people. Today you've got 10 youth, and the 10 youth are brought by one or two families. A generation ago, there were over 100 youth. You had to break them into groups for their different ages. The churches are dying. The churches are closing their doors while the pastors are distracted by the culture and the times. They're not feeding the sheep, and the unfed sheep become this malnourished starving person looking to be filled up with something. They become victims and the non-Christian religions, the non-Christian philosophies, the non-Christian ideologies, the non-Christian mentalities eat them alive. The buck stops with the preachers. At the end of the day, this phenomena is our fault. And it says, since there are no shepherds, is what the passage says, there are pastors who are going to stand before God and he's going to say to them, the job that you did as a pastor was so bad that it was like there was no pastor at all. If you're a pastor able to hear that, that should scare you. Can you imagine if God said, ooh, you're, 
your, your job of pastoring was so terrible, it was, it was almost as if there was no pastor at all. One day in the future, after America herself is in captivity, that generation that's sitting behind the fences, behind the barbed wire, is going to look back on American history, and they're going to do an Ezekiel-style autopsy of the last days of this nation, and part of the blame is going to belong to the politicians that let it happen, but a huge part of the blame is going to belong to the preachers that let it happen. The point of no return where nothing further can be done to save the nation that's rebelling against God in our time period in 2024, that point of no return where it's irrecoverable is not that far away. Do you understand what I'm saying? Verses 9 and 10. Therefore, you shepherds, listen to what Yahweh says. This is what Adonai Yahweh says. Watch out. I'm coming after you, shepherds. I'm going to uh, I'm going to demand my sheep back from their hands and fire them as shepherds. The shepherds won't be shepherds anymore when I snatch my flock right out of their mouths so they can't be eaten by them anymore. So even though judgment of the nation has fallen and judgment of the church has fallen, that's not the end of the story because there's going to be a judgment of the leadership individually. The preachers who advance black liberation theology, you look and you feel and you act and you speak like you're getting away with it. And to the untrained eye, you're out of the woods. You're in the wind. You're home free. You're in the clear. You're getting away with it. In order to carry water for the one world socialist dictatorship of the Antichrist, you're willing to proclaim the one world ecumenical religion of the false prophet. And you're willing to exploit people's pain and their sadness and their anger about the history of this country and some of the things that happened to this day. Instead of preaching theology, you're preaching sociology. Instead of preaching the Protestant work ethic, you're preaching European socialistic redistributive government plan economics and you're destroying your own brothers and sisters you're destroying your own sheep and you're invoking the name of Jesus while you're doing it it is a road to destruction you're doing harm and you need to stop it reverse course and start preaching the truth once again of the death the burial and the resurrection of God the son as the only method by which someone can be made judicially not guilty in the sight of a holy and just God I can't think of a better note upon which to end this message than breaking it down like this. So-called white evangelicalism. It traces itself to the great awakening of the colonial period. The great awakening in the colonial states of America were among the Methodists, the Pietists, the Puritans, and the Quakers, all of which opposed the slave trade, by the way, the Puritans wouldn't even extend you the right hand of fellowship if you own slaves. They viewed you as being in sin. Like if a lesbian couple came in here trying to join, we would not view you as another Christian. That's how they saw slave owners. It's in the historical records. The Methodist, pious Puritans, and Quakers, they traced themselves to the Protestant Reformation back in Europe. The Protestant Reformation was, was for the most part, begun with uh, Martin Luther, John Calvin, and Ulrich Zwingli. Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli, though French, though German, though Swiss, though they were white dudes in Europe, they traced their ideas to a man named St. Augustine. Augustine of Hippo. Where's Hippo? It's in what today we would call Algeria. Where's Algeria? North Africa. What does history tell us Augustine was? He was a black man. On the flip side of the coin, so-called black liberation theology comes out of liberation theology, and liberation theology comes out of neo-orthodoxy. And neo-orthodoxy comes partially out of rationalism, which is German, white, and partially out of Marxism, which is both Russian and German, but also both are white. Dr. Shanley, are you telling me that what I've been taught to view as white evangelicalism actually originates from a black man in North Africa named Augustine? Yep. Dr. Shanley, are you telling me that what I've been taught to view as black theology actually originates from white people in Europe like Karl Marx and Johann Semler? Yep. 
It's white European philosophy, white European political science, white European economics in blackface with a cross on it. And when someone teaches you that up is down and down is up, when someone teaches you that white is black and black is white, you are officially faced with textbook satanic deception. A satanic deception that wants you to abandon all that Christianity believes in, abandon all that Christianity stands for, all that we've held strong and suffered for and died to advance across this planet for 2,000 years. No, you need to abandon that. If you left your Christian church home where you once grew up, you were in the youth group, your grandma used to bring you there because you've heard the arguments of the white Marxists that created black liberation theology. I feel that in this message you've been given plenty to think about. You've left for the wrong reasons. You need to come back home. We're all going to be meeting in a month here. Uh, raise your hand if you learned something today that you didn't know before. Raise your hand if you feel like the, the gospel was preached, the, the word of God was expounded on. All right, well, my work here is done. Uh, let's get some music going.